This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal, medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Good morning, true seekers and true crime junkies. Welcome back with Nanette on Hit the Road, uh, Jack, Finding the Zodiac. We are continuing last week's talk in regards to the cipher solve or the, um, the decode of the 1963 letter in regards to the assassination of JFK that was mailed on December 3rd of 1963 by the Zodiac. Um, today is actually the 59th anniversary of JFK's uh, address at American University in Washington, D.C. on June 10th of 1963. Um, I did take some time to review that speech. It is about 27 minutes long and fairly easy to find on the internet. There was a couple excerpts I wanted to take some time to go ahead and share with people, which I thought was extremely interesting. This speech was in regards to bringing an end to the Cold War between Russia and the United States. Um, some of the things that he had to say in this speech was, what kind of peace do I mean? What kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I'm talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. Very powerful stuff, gives me goosebumps to read. He says, first, let us examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many of us think it is impossible. Too many think it unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. So let us persevere. Peace not be impractical and war need not be inevitable. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all peoples to see it, to draw hope from it, and move irresistibly toward it. Again, a very moving speech, likely not what America likes to hear because we enjoy war, it seems like, and it seems as though um, JFK was moving towards the halt of any type of war or at least engaging in it. So um, I have done some research this last week in regards to the um, JFK and RFK period. This is some notes that I briefly jotted down, or at least it's my synopsis on what I was able to find and research. Um, we have been talking about the uh, mob influence on politics and um, why I have even brought this to people's attention in regards to the Zodiac case and, and Jack. Um, a lot of the things that we're going to hear in regards to this, we see in the communications from this suspect, including things like racketeering, underground, um, perverted systems, syndicates. Uh, he talks about being smarter than law enforcement and FBI, which is the opposing side here with RFK um, and, and the CIA. So my take on it was is that Kennedy was voted president with 8,000 fraudulent ballots from, ballots from Chicago, Illinois, while Mayor Daley was in charge. This was done through the mob and union officials. Now, keep in mind that JFK and RFK also shared Marilyn Monroe with Sam Giancana, a mob boss. Um, was this, I, I, I had to wonder, was this to elicit information from our government officials? Was she a socialite that was involved in the MK Ultra program? There was a lot of areas or a lot of ways that my brain went with that. But let me just give you some background on Mayor Daly at that particular time. I was able to determine that, um, Mayor Daley was originally the comptroller in Chicago, Illinois. Um, he had the cops in his pocket. He was mob connected. He was Irish. Um, he had support 
and supported both the Kennedys and the LBJ connections. So he was fairly mixed up in just about everything. And so far as I can tell, the past two mayors that we spoke about, one in the lipstick killings and now here in JFK, we have a very corrupt system that's operating out of Chicago. And as I continued to do my research in regards to the situation, I found that all of the key points or places that we will see letters written to by the Zodiac that are included in the FBI FOIA files um, include Pennsylvania, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Chicago, um, Dallas, Texas, uh, California, all of these locations where I am finding communications and serial killings that happen to take place around political strife. So back to JFK's presidential win also included funding from the mob and the union for his ca campaign. The goal of the mob and the unions were to get back into Havana, Cuba to reclaim their casinos, racetracks, and drugs. And they believed that JFK would help them do this. Um, JFK also at this time is placing price caps on things like steel and lumber. This is infuriating many big business owners. And we also see the ACI or CIA operation during this time called the Bay of Pigs, which is also referenced in the Ram Ramsey ransom note um, with a sign off of SBTC. Now, this was also an epic failure of strategic planning hoped that the, and hoped that Kennedy would send uh, American fighters to take over the beach when they arrived. And when they didn't, they were all that were participating in this point had been lost and most of the countries were looking down on the U.S. for even having attempted this. When the goal of getting Castro out was not obtained, we see that JFK is assassinated. Um, we also see that Hoffa then goes and uses $500,000 of the Teamsters Pension Fund for the backing of President Nixon, yet another epic failure for this country in the Watergate scandal. And we have a long history of the same families running our state and federal governments to the benefit of those that are not legal, moral, or ethical. So this isn't stopped. We've seen this still today, and we need to re we need to review our history to make sure we don't continue as an American, American as a um, citizen of this country country, that we don't continue to allow these type of people to run our countries. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was doing the research on most of these mob uh, members is that they were being uh, arrested and indicted for things like extortion, racketeering, money laundering, tax evasion, but never murder. I could not find, as I looked through them, anybody who had a sentence for murder, though we know they were responsible for killing many people, and it was very well aware that these people were um, underground criminals. And, uh, and to that degree, we also saw a letter back in Black Dahlia, in which case the um, purported accomplice indicated that the individual who committed the crime and killed the real estate agent was a racketeer. So we are seeing these cross connections between both mob, CIA, and the communications that are coming out of the Zodiac Killer. So today we are going to relook at a solve that Harriet worked on really hard this last week in regards to the 1963 envelope. And we're also going to hear from Nolan Del Campo, attorney at law, in regards to their take. So that was my brief synopsis, and they're going to get to tell us how they re reviewed it, their research, and um, what it is they believe was taking place at this time. So I'm going to go ahead and have this presentation put up before we bring them in, just so I can run down um, the letter that we're talking about. This is the 1963 letter. It says Oswald case, check either Howard or Spencer, perhaps Howard Spencer, link Ruby to Oswald. And this was mailed to the Dallas police in Dallas, Texas. And we see the um, beginning of the solve that Harriet was actually working on. Of course, this is just a preliminary. And we're going to introduce now Harriet Sucher, or Suchet, sorry, Harriet, um, to give us her, her lowdown on this particular solve of the envelope. Oh my God, um, when you brought this attention to me about this envelope, um, you know, I already did the, the letter portion and that got three pages of all kinds of information. That was 2015, but the envelope was bugging me. So I was trying to work on it for like three or four days before I called you because I was also trying to locate that particular and I have it here. So, so anyways, um, Oh, okay. This version is very blurry. And that's, I think the version that I got was, um, let's see if I can put it up here. I've got it. I've got it up yeah, on but, the screen. But it's, it's, it's just pretty, pretty, uh, the one that I had was pretty, uh, blurry and it wasn't, um, the FOIA request file that you ended up getting, um, and then sending it to 
to me um i don't know i i know all i know is i finally found it in my files and i had gotten it around 2020 and um okay so, so much more clearer okay so what we want to know is really basically what you used off of the envelope for this solve oh okay everything uh, what i've learned to do is to in jack's world this is one of the versions that he uses especially many years later in the zodiac cases um to unabbreviate everything possible and uh, to identify especially everything about the stamp so let me pull up what i have here what i ended up getting was uh, post meridium lancaster california uh, december 3rd 1963 after five days return to and then there's two lines and then palmdale california the stamp is the national christmas tree and the white house issued november 1st 1963 bureau of printing and engraving city santa claus indiana printing method Giori press perforations 11 and the stamp is united states five cents and then unabbreviating everything and part of what's on there, that cancellation, it's fight tuberculosis, cross of Lorraine, support tuberculosis association, a micro dot, and then instead of NTA, you unabbreviate that. It's the National Tuberculosis Association. And for some reason on this stamp, I mean, not the stamp, the letter, it's got a black ink stamp clock. And then it says underneath that, received December 5th, 1963. And instead of just saying Dallas police, um, you have to fill in everything there. I learned to find out the complete address as known at the time. So that would be Dallas Police Department Municipal Building Annex 106 South Harwood, Dallas, Texas. And out of all of that, that's when you anagram. And that's the labor of love hours. <laughs> so, and then that's what you've basically done this next slide. I'm kind of showing how you've numbered that's each the one. Well, that's the preliminary, but. Correct. And uh, here is our, our and final. Yeah, because um, then I realized uh, once I was working on it, there's a series of code keys. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but I'll try to be brief. Um, the first code keys that I found were the key code keywords was a complete spelling of attorney general and then Robert F. Kennedy and then Washington District of Columbia and then North American International Brotherhood of Teamsters. I'm going like this because I'm seeing it on the screen. <laughs> anyway, right. um, well, those were the code keywords, actually, um, all of that. And then I realized it's going to say something about Hoffa. But that is a, as I further went down into decoding this, Hoffa became just a code keyword itself and it had to be broken up and move the F's and the A's and the H to other sections. But um, it was um, really a pretty easy decode to get, but surprising because um, I'll just read it off the screen. It comes Please. out as. Yeah, it's AG or Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. The message is meant for Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, North American International Brotherhood of Teamsters Union, Cappuccino Lover, Hoffa, launder retirement pension in the morning of November 7th, 1963 in four Gucci suitcases to, and I know I'm going to not say this word correctly because it's a foreign language, but it's BTS, which is the airport, airport code for Bratislava. Oh, I said it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Bratislava, Czechoslovakia airport. And then it says Sam Giancana Goons, Lee Bowers Jr., Carlos Savella on the railroad tracks, braiding johnny rosselli shot president and coroner reveal five perforations coroner sent 16 micro stills democrats man jfk by van via south to north of mexico to us i-5 and arrived 9 36 p.m 11 30 1963 so november 30th 1963 a.d to classified e palmdale address 
hid JFK there. Medical examiner Hume's lies. UTL, which means unable to locate, President CIA said use RO, which is responding officer Tippett. So Dean Rusk authorized Tag O'Neill, the mortician, to cut back of head hair, plated, do a plaster cast, fit hair to make Tippett look like JFK for obituary pictures, carbon copies sent to United States Press International, which is a Hearst run organization it's the competitor to ap just so, another one of those media connections well yeah, i'm going to go ahead so, and take this down now and i'm going to bring in nolan and we're going to start talking about some of these facts good morning nolan good morning Nanette. good morning harriet good morning thank you so um what did you think of that that solve that she had there nolan well, it's kind of rambling. Um, it mentions a lot of different names that I know are involved in the Kennedy assassination, and it, it makes references to people being taken or going to Mexico or this or that. But the very end is quite disturbing about how they're trying to make Officer Tippett look like JFK through mm -hmm. surgery and whatnot. That's, that's highly disturbing. Well, <laughs> I just want to interject there. I found this um, to back up a lot of people because, again, I went in person and then I also knew and met um, Judith Berry Baker, especially on Facebook. And a lot of people that would come to these conferences, some of them would be bringing up about how Tippett was switched and you'd want to sit back and take a deep breath. And, you know, some people would leave the room because they just didn't want to go that far. But this is saying that, you know, those people were correct, that their research that they did through years of, of going through all these files and meeting people who lived the history, saying something didn't add up right. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is confirming, because um, how do you get something like this? This is sent in 1963. And once you understand Jack and his people's system, how is it done? He's telling a message to to um, Robert F. Kennedy, who's the attorney general going after Hoppe still, trying to bring him down, you know, that this is where what happened. And it would take, um, cause I, my family used to travel the Southwest to go back East a lot. Um, if you were traveling by night and you had to go South to into Mexico and then, you know, go through and then come up I-5, which I-5 was there then at the time, um, into the border of near, um, I think it's Tijuana. Anyways, it would take six days if you were doing, if you were driving by night, it would take six or seven days to get there because you're sneaking a body into, <laughs> you're doing the reverse instead of sneaking drugs into the country, you're sneaking a body. Now, I know that there's another individual. Um, if, if we could get the presentation popped up real quick, I'd like to show everybody this picture once again. Um, this picture is actually a picture mm -hmm. out of what is called the controversy papers. And the gentleman that, that actually wrote this book um, spent about 40 years in researching, reading files and going and combing through things. And he actually also believes that there was some use for Officer Tibbetts, which is why he was killed during the commission of the assassination of JFK. And we can see in this picture how very close he is actually to JFK. So one half of this picture is JFK to the left, mm -hmm. to the right, we see that that is Officer Tibbetts. So um, this is a, a, a line of reasoning that many have believed that um, allowed them to perpetuate the single bullet theory. Because if JFK was hit with three bullets, then you wouldn't want to be able to show that to the American public. You want to show them somebody who's only been hit once. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in this particular case, um, um, Officer Tibbetts was shot behind the ear in the back of the head um, in, in, in a manner with a single bullet. So, all right, I'm going to take that back down and bring mm -hmm. that back up and let Nolan go ahead and respond to um, the Officer Tibbetts. <laughs> there are a lot of mysteries in the JFK assassination story, but one of the biggest mysteries is why was Tibbetts killed and what relation did his killing have mm -hmm. to, to the assassination? But I think the main thing that most people agree on is that one of the reasons is they could tie Lee Harvey Oswald to Tippett and then say, well, he killed Tippett and he killed Kennedy. Mm -hmm. It just gave him another reason to focus on Oswald as a lone assassin. But now I'm hearing these other things about Tippett 
that kind of makes sense you know, in the bigger <laughs> picture that that, that uh, kind of helps solve a little bit of the mystery of it because it seems like a senseless death to, to almost yes. all the researchers. You know, wh why did Tippett have to die? So, right. Well, here's the thing that... One thing I want oh, to go ahead. You that, though, too. The theory is that, yes, there were three gunshots fr from the school book depository that allegedly Oswald fired. The single bullet issue is the magic bullet theory, which is one bullet hit Kennedy, mm -hmm bounced off the interior of the car and also hit governor john Connolly, who was riding in the same car that's the magic bullet theory that that was it came up uh arlen specter on the warren commission came up with the magic bullet theory which is a separate issue gotcha well, well this thing right now is becoming I, i'm wondering am i gonna have a new book called the um, magic mortician theory <laughs> because, <laughs> you know because this is a mortician doing his magic, you know, and taking somebody who looks closely to JFK and then doing plaster casting. All I'm like the details that are coming out uh, just doing this. But here's the blow away part that I didn't want to. Um, and when I do, I don't want to appear to be force fitting, but I knew that the national Christmas tree sat on the ellipsis as it sits there every year. It's called the ellipsis. And that part of Washington, D.C. is designed off of the Zodiac by Charles L'Enfant. And the, the ellipsis is the Zodiac. So get this. The address of the ellipsis is um, oh, 15th Street Northwest, E Street, something like that. But where this classified E address is, where it leads to 15th Street and E something, when you look, look that up in Palmdale, it is classified. It's um, still run by um, the government and it's a classified address. It's a government operated uh, contractor, no, government owned contractor operated, but it's, um, it's, it's Lockheed Martin and what they do for NASA and for the Air Force. Wow. So, it sits right there, so that and it's all, and it's classified what they do there. <laughs> and, and it's of course we deal. <laughs> and so. we do see yes, and we do see that this particular postcard from from Zodiac Jack was purchased in Palmdale, California. Yeah. So and it's it's saying to return to a certain portion there. Uh, oh, what I didn't say, and I'll show it here. Um, well, the two lines look like railroad tracks when you replace it. And he's saying that uh, Bowers and um, Savella, who was a, a hit, uh, he worked. Oh, Savella family was a very big mob connection family there. And uh, Carlos Savella is the son of Nicholas Savella, who's a trained assassin. So Carlos Savella knew how to be assassin too. But um, so when you take those two lines, and move it over it looks like the railroad tracks and southern pacific went to that part of palmdale at the time <laughs> in that well, area and, <laughs> and i've already so. stated that in many cases and in many of these communications and in many of these murders the railroad tracks actually come into play so mm -hmm. things like um gravel pit yards cement yards um linen companies mm -hmm. uh many of these things that you can find as cross connections including the fact that the zodiac case in itself was labeled as an extortion case this is a serial killer and and the case is labeled as extortion. It makes me feel like we're looking right back at the mob again, who has never been mm -hmm. indicted for murder and only for ex extortion and racketeering. So the, the railroad tracks fits right on in with the theme of the Zodiac and the murders that mm -hmm. we're about to hear about. Well, well I think Lee we're Bowers, looking... excuse me for interjecting, Lee Bowers worked for the railroads. He was a mm -hmm. witness on the day of the assassination. Uh, behind the grassy knoll, behind the picket fence, there was a rail yard and yep. Lee Bowers was the watchman up, up high above in, in the tower in the rail yard. Mm -hmm. And he was actually a witness that was trying to uh, explain to the Warren Commission that he thought there were several people involved. He saw people running back and forth. And they actually apprehended the three tramps in, in a boxcar in that rail yard. And, and who, was, who was our three tramps? Well, the um, pictures I've studied, that there are several books, there's famous pictures. But one looks just like uh, E. Howard Hunt, 
one of the uh, plumbers in the Watergate break-in, also affiliated with the CIA for quite a long time, since the 50s and the Arbenz assassin, or the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala. Then another one looks like uh, Thomas Eli Davis, who's a known CIA operative, tall, lanky guy, the, the tall tramp. And then the other tramp in the front in the picture looks a lot like Frank Sturgis, who's also another one of the Watergate plumbers. So there's a real good book that I read years ago that makes the same connections. I don't know about uh, Thomas Eli Davis, but it makes the connections of Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt as being two of the tramps. Now, there's a most recent book on the Kennedy assassination that I've read called Coup in Dallas by H.P. Um, Alvarelli that goes way deep into Thomas Eli Davis and his, his uh, work as a killer, assassin, and his affiliations with the CIA and describes him to a T. And he looks just like the tramp, the middle tramp, the tall, slender, angular tramp with, with blonde, scruffy hair. If I have the picture in, in a couple different books, and it's a famous picture if you just Google it. And just clearly Google we know that it, in assassination. Well, clearly we know that it took far more than three people to pull off this entire <laughs> event. Um, so we know that just the three tramps are not the only people who are involved oh, no. with what's going on that day. So there are some other people that they talk about having been at both um, JFK and RFK happenings. And was that braiding that you guys were braiding, talking about? Eugene, Eugene Hale braiding. Um, so also braiding. known as Jim Braden. Yeah. Same guy. yeah. So, so Jim Braden... As Jim Braden, he's um, he's uh, seen leaving the the, the Deltex building, building right after. But um, but Eugene Hale Braden, um, oh, it's Gary Fannin has a book on on this, and uh, he has pictures that he really can't find anywhere. <laughs> he 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 got somehow through. Uh, Freedom of Information Act. Uh, he got a picture showing where there was a bullet right near what they call now not really the southern grassy knoll but right across the street and jack is saying that braiding is there you know in that area um not you know not too far from the railroad tracks um and that cops had found a bullet casing there and um so you know th that was the link right there that braiding was there but there's other people who said that braiding was also at rfk's incident and my opinion is because Braiding survived that long and didn't get killed, that he was there gathering information. <laughs> so it, well, he was going to turn and rat out a whole bunch of people. So, so we see the mob connection, obviously, with JFK. One of the things that I had never been aware of is that he, you know, that mob assisted in getting him into the presidency. And then, of course, he hired his own brother as the attorney general, and he had it out for everybody in the mob. He absolutely wanted Hoffa and all of these um, uh, gangsters to to um, be indicted for their uh, criminal activities. And so we see that playing right back into it. We have a president who's supposed to save the mob. That doesn't happen. He gets assassinated and later his brother is trying to hunt down these very same people he feels responsible for his brother's <laughs> death and we find that he's assassinated as well yeah well what i'm seeing right now um just looking at this envelope and seeing what it came up with i think we're looking at the the foundation for setting up for the zodiac killer because that's Washington, the, the Zodiac, the Rotundas in the center, uh, you know. Um, so, and that's, and, and the stamp is the National Christmas Tree at the Ellipse. That's the Zodiac. Um, so, um, I think that's what we're seeing. And I think LBJ, even though he didn't like JFK, he's realizing he has to kind of go along with this because these people kill presidents and he's just a target, you know? So, right. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, I also wanted to talk about so, uh, some of the other individuals that were um, either what we refer to as suicided or murdered during this time mm -hmm. frame. And I spoke a little bit with Nolan about this. Um, of course, everybody is aware that Marilyn Monroe purportedly committed suicide by an overdose. We start to see some of these OD type murders that are going to occur here soon with the Zodiac cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is just the onset of them using the appearance that somebody is OD'd on drugs when in fact they were actually murdered. So yep. um, bringing that to heart, not just Marilyn Monroe, but Nolan had brought to mind, um, it was- Two journalists, female journalists. Mm -hmm. Well, what One, about the Dorothy other- One, Dorothy Kilgallen, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, she was actually kind of like a Rona Barrett. She was a gossip columnist, but she was also a, a legitimate journalist. And she was the only journalist to interview Jack Ruby while he was in, in custody in jail. And she planned to write a book on her version, or A, her interview with Ruby, and her version of the events on November 22nd, 1963. But shortly before her book uh, was able to be published, she was suicided. Basically, mm -hmm. she died of an overdose of alcohol and barbiturates. But that's, uh, they, they attribute it to suicide. I don't believe it. No, that, no, that one. That one's so many. Lisa Howard, mm -hmm. another journalist, famous journalist in her time, and she was being used for back channel peace negotiations with the Castro regime. In fact, there's pictures of her in one of the books I have with Che Guevara, and it's also alleged that she was the lover of Fidel Castro. But anyway, mm -hmm. that being a, that that's just a side note. Right. <laughs> but, but she she was uh, basically <laughs> overdosed as well. And she ended up dying in the hospital later that day. Mm -hmm. And then we had one more. We had a second um, uh, affair, right? So aside from Marilyn, JFK also had a second. Uh, he I haven't had brought lots her of up. Affairs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But his okay, favorite, so his favorite <laughs> was Mary Meyer, the the ex-wife of Cord Meyer, a high-ranking CIA official. And mm, Mary Meyer. This was after JFK was assassinated, maybe a right. year later, a year and a half later. She was shot in the head and in the body, and she was just, she was killed. It was She was murdered. It, that's never been solved. And then Correct. later, when Cord Meyer, they were already divorced at the time that she was killed, even at the time of JFK. But later, prior to Cord Meyer's death, they asked Cord, who do you think killed Mary? And he said, the same people that killed JFK. And implying plural implying he knew and yet he was cia implying the cia was at least partially responsible oh right. yeah i mean even this song brings up saying the cia said you know tell rusk and then rusk authorizes to you know um to just do your mortician's magic and um and jack calls him a tag which is um i told nanette what it's it's a derogatory meaning to um to somebody who well we really can't say the word it's kind of like calling an irishman the n-word and um because i had to look it up i said i've seen this word before and i got so many solves nolan <laughs> i got hundreds i got hundreds that yeah. even annette hasn't seen but he's used the word before and um well, so he's calling o'neill who's the funeral director at that funeral home a really bad word. <laughs> so. Well, Dean Rusk was not technically CIA. Dean Rusk was State Department. Mm -hmm. He wasn't Secretary of State at that time, but later mm -hmm. he became Secretary of State under LBJ. And mm -hmm. then again, later, he comes back as Secretary of State for a later president. I think it may have been Nixon for a while. But anyway, well, Rick, Rusk is one of those guys that never goes away. He's just always hanging around. Yeah. But, but I'm sure he had ties with the CIA. Well, but he was in the State Department. He he, um, the, he lives on too. I, I've discussed this with Nanette, and I think um, it's kind of safe to say that the people who continue to live on that may have been involved uh, lived on. So you know they paid their debt back to society another way by ratting out all kinds of people and helping kill the other people. It's well, you know righteous vigilantes. That's what we called it on the last show. Nixon it's just unbelievable. Nixon was in Dallas that day too, and lots of different people were in Dallas. Uh, Bush, mm -hmm. uh, George Bush Senior was yeah, Bush, in yep. Dallas that day. I, and, I'm, I'm pretty sure another, young young Clinton was there too. It's crazy. Um, at, at one point, yeah, he met, he shook hands with Kennedy. Um, you know, young Bill Clinton. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, after hearing all of this stuff with JFK and RFK, I really feel bad that uh, Clinton was, you know ostracized for Monica Lewinsky when we find out that our former presidents all have multiple partners. It's kind of a yeah. disgusting little affair here, but yeah. nobody seems to be on the up and up. Mm -mm. Yeah. And one thing that we need to point out is that it wasn't just the mob and the CIA that, that didn't like the Kennedys. J. Edgar Hoover hated the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy was technically his boss. They didn't, they, they wouldn't even talk to each other. And, uh, and who was in charge of the investigation after both assassinations? Hoover. 
the FBI. <laughs> who, who failed to solve it? Hoover. Right. Mm -hmm. Who uh, forever denied the existence of the mafia? Hoover. Yeah. So, now, now Hoover, did he run FBI or? Yeah, forever. Since like 1924. Until he died. Yeah, and so, he, and, exactly. And, and so our opposition in the CIA is Dulles or Helms at this point? Alan Dulles ran the CIA forever. And even, see, after the Bad Pigs, JFK fired Alan Dulles and Richard Bissell, the second in command, oh because God, he Bissell. felt that they had tricked him in regard to, to the, the chance for success of the Bay of Pigs. And basically what they wanted, they knew it was doomed to fail. They wanted JFK and the military to come in and do airstrikes to, to protect the, the men that were invading that landed on the Bay of Pigs. So when JFK refused to send the, uh, the Air Force in, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and uh, the CIA, everyone really, really resented that. Is this Bissell, um, I'm just going to throw this in here, related to the woman last name Bissell who started the Tuberculosis Association and using the Cross of Lorraine for us? <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> that might be just the way Jack was trying yeah. to relate in by yeah, saying tuberculosis. This, that might be his way Bissell. of saying Bissell. <laughs> That it absolutely is. Bristol, which is the CIA, second in command CIA. Because well, even after they were probably, out the CIA, okay. Bissell. Okay. Dulles, Dulles still ran the CIA until he died, basically. Even though he wasn't director anymore, it was uh, McCone was the first director, and then later Richard Helms. But one of the people that was there the whole time was uh, Angleton. Mm -hmm. James well, Jesus Angleton. I think you've well, talked about Angleton before, haven't you, Harriet? Oh yeah, he's well, like yeah. he was in charge yeah. of CIA security in the United States, but basically he was in charge of assassinations. Well, I just so, wanted to say one more thing, really quick: the Cross of Lorraine that Bissell, the lady, started the design for the Tuberculosis Association that orig originates out of. I'm going to say this word wrong: Bratislava. <laughs> it originates right out of there because that was the capital of uh, the the Hungarian kingdom, and that's the cross of Lorraine comes right out of there. So there's so much that Jack is saying in this envelope. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was I already knew where the cross of Lorraine came from, but um, I was oh my god. Then you bring up about Bissell, and you know, I had to re-educate myself of the National Tuberculosis Association. Of this last this would be. Bissell. <laughs> this would kind of be like when Jack's Jack's reference to um, super fudge, meaning that it worked well, the fourth grader or the anthrax attack worked well. So mm -hmm. you talking about this tuberculosis association, it's association with Bissell and Bissell actually cross referencing itself back to somebody who is involved with the In situation. The is exactly the way Zodiac does things. Zodiac 101 yeah. is to twist. There's one to two meanings for everything he does. But if you look deep enough in it, it is pointing in a particular direction. Yeah, he's, this he is thinks he's so clever and so funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm a little well, enamored. I'm not going to lie. Like some of the times when I'm I have just... to read some of this stuff and realize that what he's really saying um, is kind of like watching a commercial these days where they might be giving you one message that you perceive, but underlying is a completely That's different cool. message that means something totally different. So, wow. <laughs> uh, Nanette, if I, if I may at this point, you, you started the show with, with saying that this is the anniversary, the 59th anniversary of the JFK uh, commencement address at American University. And basically that, that speech is one of the most famous speeches in history. It's, it's known as the peace speech. And right. I think that goes, basically what it says, he wanted to uh, disarm. He Not right. only did he want to have a nuclear test ban, he wanted, his ultimate goal was disarmament. And that really upset the military and, mm -hmm. and the military industrial complex. So we right. can't forget that who's benefiting from, from these, these assassinations. It's the richest of the rich. It's the people right. that build bombs. It's the people that wire, what, who benefits when there's wars? The people that make planes, the people that build tanks, the people Bombay that make ammunition. <laughs> and it, it's not just Americans, it's international. Correct. It's interna yeah. And it's been going on forever, but especially since World War II. 
Correct. When you said that, I'm thinking Lockheed Martin and uh, the the it's class. It says it's classified when you try to look this up, you know. And then, and um, that that's where this is saying that they brought the president's body by November 30th, and you know this is after a funeral that everybody cried over, thinking. And, and I just have to tell people um, that that was not JFK in the ca casket. For all we know, it was Smokey the Bear. I mean, <laughs> we, we, yeah. we just. Uh, I mean, who was in the casket, or what was in the casket? That one of the that, best. Oh my God! That leads people, people who did discussions about how the casket didn't weigh the same. Where they were, you know, the uh, you. Oh my God! What's his name? Uh, Hubert Clark. Um, he got into heated arguments with people. He's the first. He was the African American who made history. You know, holding onto the casket, and people were telling him there was a different weight in the casket. Didn't you notice? And he would. There was heated arguments at the Dallas conference that. Oh my God. And he said, well, you know, Hey, you know, I didn't open up the casket. No, I didn't see who was in there. I was just, you know, carrying the casket, but you know, who was in there? What was in there now? Will we ever really know? I mean, now I'm, I'm pretty convinced that that was not JFK in there. And I was a little girl, <laughs> my parents and people were watching TV when this happened. The, uh, you know, November 25th was a funeral in 1963. And, um, you know, Somebody was in there. Somebody died. A lot of people died over this. But, you know, that's where we cry over that. Right. One of the best books on the JFK assassination, it's an older book. It's it's called Crossfire, written by Jim Mars. Okay. And there's a picture of purportedly Lee Harvey Oswald in his casket. And it looks nothing like Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. So, I, in fact, I have that picture. I'm going to try and find it real quick. And maybe we can put it on the screen. Right, right. I, I've met Jim Mars. I, I've, you know, uh, met a whole number of people that are no, now no longer with us. But um, I met Tosh Plum Lee, who, who was mad. And I was saying that Johnny Roselli was at, you know, was there because he, he brought Johnny Roselli and other people there on a plane. And um, I think Johnny, I think the interesting yeah. part of this entire thing is that they they led us to believe certain facts mm -hmm. in this particular case for many years. And as we see, as we go down the road with this stuff, that most of the most of the happenstances that the government is responsible for does not even become public knowledge until 30, 40 years after the fact. Um, and, and with that being said, I mean, it falls in line with Alan Dulles actually um, uh, destroying most of the paperwork in regards to the MK Ultra project. Luckily, one of the um, clerks had misfiled 30,000 of those documents mm -hmm. in the wrong location. So they were not discovered or destroyed as Doulis had instructed. And that's how we even became to find out about the MK Ultra project and the possibility that obviously Jack's proximity to all of the happenstances there um, also mm -hmm. led me to believe that he was involved. Um, and, and that's not despite the fact that we see some of those solves in the Zodiac letters from Lauren Swearing indicating that MK Ultra was yeah. something that he was a part of. Well, that's where Jack and his world, his crew. Come down came. a little bit. There we look go. Yep. Yeah. No, that doesn't look like him. Does that look like Lee Harvey Oswald to you? Nope. <laughs> nope. Just, just hold it still. But uh, no, that doesn't. Oh. No, uh, no, no I mean, not, not from what I was used to seeing. Where was yeah. he Another shot? Partition's magic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Where, where was he shot? Was he shot in the head? Was he shot in the stomach? No, he was shot in the gut. He was in the gut. He was shot in the gut. And that's where uh, that's where um, uh, Mel Belli took the case because he was shot in the gut, but led to left to bleed for 45 minutes to an hour. And, and Mel Belli was saying, well, okay, Ruby shot him. But the death is on the responsibility of the first responders in the hospital who let him bleed right there. So, so, um, and, oh. and uh, my family's attorney, William Bernstein, worked on, uh, he's no longer with us, but uh, a very good friend of my family, William Bernstein, worked on uh, the Jack Ruby case. We always thought that was a unique thing. But <laughs> so we got about to, five, we've got about 
I'm sorry, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm just giving you guys a heads up at this particular point. Um, okay. But I do find it interesting oh, that Melvin Bell, Melvin Belli is one of the people that the Zodiac wrote to. So if everybody can kind of start to see how I've put this together and why I believe there's a heavy mob, CIA, media, um, polit political, and um, big money um, instance, you start to see why I believe that Jack had a handler and that Jack wasn't um, killing people because he wanted to. It's because he had to. And some of those people that were killed were just innocent bystanders to make it look like it was a serial killing. And so this is how I really came to that's some of these conclusions throughout my research. Well, that's supposed to be the presentation to make you look over there and think it's a lover's lane thing that um, these people were innocent bystanding people, you know, when the truth is over off in your peripheral vision and Jack and his crew were you know, sending out these cryptic messages. You, you talked about how MK Ultra was that like files were destroyed. Well, Jack and his, what he's doing is he's, you know, preserved MK Ultra and what was going on in these cryptic communications that we're still finding years later. I'm working on stuff that is, oh my God. Um, I want to make two last points. The first point yeah. is Alan Dulles's brother, John Foster Dulles, was the Secretary of State under Eisenhower for eight years. And, and you've Richard seen Nixon SOS. Was the vice president. Excuse me. And you've seen SOS come up many times in the cryptic messages, right, Harriet? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Seen, and your second yeah. point, Nolan? The second point is Jack Ruby silenced Oswald, but Jack Ruby was silenced as well because yep. he died in prison before his trial could come about. The only people that really had access to him were, were, uh, Belli and the journalists mm -hmm. Kilgallen, and they silenced her as well. So mm -hmm. everybody pretty much involved that could tell they this didn't story want any was of the literal. Facts to come out. It's it's amazing, and, okay. and it's amazing how intricate and how many different people were actually involved, and and, and, to, and to believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone gunman, crazed gunman with with, with uh, Soviet and Cuban sympathies. And that's why he killed Kennedy. It's, it's a joke. It's a farce. Well, yeah. you're bringing about Oswald. It was just, what was it, a couple of weeks that he did that bus trip from Dallas into into Mexico? Allegedly. Well, and, yeah. And, um, well. There was a, uh, a double. There was an Oswald doppelganger as well. Well, Judith oh. Barry Baker knew Oswald. And um, she said that he did the bus trip to try to get some reconnaissance or some kind of information. Now I'm seeing, this is like, what, 60 something years later, the possibilities of how it was to see what was going to happen, go into Mexico and drive at night and whatever they were going to do. And then you brought up about the military industrial complex, very pissed off about, you know, Kennedy's gonna disarm and, you know, gonna do something about the Vietnam escalation. And um, a lot of those, <laughs> The, the mob connected to, oh my God, Lockheed Martin. Oh my God. So yeah. I actually, I've had an opportunity to be out at Lockheed Martin on a couple occasions. And I, I taught handwriting classes to the American Society of Industrial Security International. Um, so I, I've been out there. And of course, in those meetings, you have Homeland Security, you have the governor's mm -hmm. detail, you have privatized security, contract security, all of the things that actually fall along the lines of what you're talking about, this industrial it's complex. Amazing. So very true, very true. Well, yeah. we are about down to one minute at this point. Is there any last statements that anybody would like to make? Yes. Uh, yeah. Stain Caesar, the security guard for Robert F. Kennedy, who's suspected mm -hmm. of being the one who actually did the kill shot to the back of the head. I believe he worked for Lockheed, and, and his alleged job was a, a plumber. <laughs> it was a for the water gate well, breaking disperses. Well, and like I said, some of these mobsters had legitimate businesses like mortuaries, so they could cover some of these fix ups on these murders mm -hmm. um, in linen companies. And we know that Jack went to work for a linen company. So we see that Jack's menial jobs, which really didn't pay much, um, really <laughs> allowed him to get around, do what he wanted, buy, buy what he wanted, when he wanted. And that was something I could never explain. How on those incomes could he afford to do that? So. Um, uh, that's it. I think we're pretty much done. You guys get the I, books, I, get, get the books. The books. <laughs> they're on, these are just, there's 200 solves in these books that, and awesome. it, I walk it, walk people through, I show them, 
they're on lulu.com but you can find them on the retailers but i i'm not making them you know money a lot of money anyways i'm making something but my point of view is keep going and keep you know revealing the truth <laughs> Jack left the truth to be found if you follow his system and you know what he's using. He uses ciphers, he uses stenographic code, um, and then sometimes a stenographic code which cipher, with cipher symbols in them, and then you got an anagram from there. I, I'm just amazed, uh, you know, and um, some and many times I've had Jack come to me in dreams, tell you, tell you the truth, to say, oh. well, try it this way. And then I wake oh, up. Oh, we're what, and we're one minute past now, Harriet. Anyways, but I want to thank good. you guys for being here. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Take care, and mm -hmm. we'll see you next week. Bye now. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.